It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the unassailable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How you doing this morning, John? Fantastic. Thanks for you doing today, Andy. I'm doing. I'm doing really well. Was we're a few days from spring, you know, in the in the Northeast. Uh, good, good things are, are coming. Or I, I hear there's going to be a plague of locusts this spring, or what? What do you call this? The cicadas and everything. But you know, we'll survive. We'll survive that. <laughs> spring is in the air, John, and uh, we have us a real bona fide uh, native-born son of this great country, a real bona fide American hero to discuss today, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the greatest inventor in history. In fact, that's our title today, and I think it's very true. Uh, it's hard to look around, even in a modern building, and not see something that he had a hand in creating. You know, everywhere you look, if you're if, you know listening to this podcast, for instance, and you're using the benefits of the uh, inventions of the great Thomas Alva Edison. That's that's correct. From the phonograph. To the electric light, to the to the lighting system, to the motion picture industry, I mean Edison was a significant contributor in in all of those you know all of those inventions and and all of those fields. He he his he was so prolific; it's almost unbelievable. He ended with uh, nine patents and had started something like fourteen companies. Uh, just an incredibly prolific, as you say, uh, inventor, but not just an inventor. He wasn't just sort of an ivory tower figure. He was interested in the enterprises that one could build off of these inventions. Right. That's right. Edison was a businessman. He was an entrepreneur. He wanted to make money, and he did. He uh, he tailored his inventions to the marketplace. He, he definitely he definitely uh, sought commercial success, and he gained it. I mean, he was he was worth millions of dollars I've, uh, when he retired. You know, in the early twentieth century, I think as one biographer said, twelve million dollars. Now that's a lot of money today. Um, Back you know, hundred years ago, that was really a lot of money. I'm not sure what the purchasing power was, but I know when he sold because this was like forty years earlier, but when he sold the quadruplex telegraph to Western Union, like in the eighteen seventies for ten thousand dollars, I saw that that ten thousand dollars say is worth two hundred and twenty six thousand dollars today. You know. So mm -hmm. um now, of course, 40 years later, uh, you know, the government might have been inflating the money supply. I don't know. But they haven't inflated the money supply nearly as much as they are today. So Edison's $12 million, you know, in 1920-something, was the purchasing power of that today would be vastly greater. So, yeah, he, he, he yeah, wanted he, to make money, and he did. Like many uh, heroes that we've talked about on this show, he had a pretty inauspicious start. Uh, he it's was funny. homeschooled by his mother, Nancy, who was a, a, a school teacher. But he was a late talker. You know, he didn't begin speaking until about the age of four. And it's really interesting. You know, another here that we talked about on the show, Thomas Sowell, the great economist and defender of freedom. Uh, he's written quite a bit about this late talker syndrome. And he thinks that it's caused by the brain devoting lots of its mental resources, resources it would otherwise put into developing speech, into other parts of the brain, into developing, so, you know, perhaps in, in Edison's case, the mechanical parts of the brain. So just an interesting tidbit here. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, like that many. Is, is, that is interesting. Uh -huh. We should give his dates too, John. Uh, Edison's dates, 1847 to 1931. So he lived to be 84, which is a ripe old old age, uh, especially back, you know, 1931, there was no antibiotics. The antibiotics were just in the process of being developed. They weren't commercially available. So, you know, 84 certainly was a ripe old age. Today, Walter Williams, you know, a hero, Thomas Sowell's good buddy, uh, died at age 84, same, you know, uh, same age. Maybe that's a, a, an age for heroes. Uh, so anyway, 1847, <laughs> yeah, 1847 to 1931, Edison's uh, dates. While you were talking, a couple of things occurred to me, um, you know, about being a, being a late talker. Uh, one of One of our... Both of us, I think, could say one of our favorite heroes of all time is Benjamin Franklin. 
and you know, and, and Franklin in his uh, in his autobiography gives this this guide to how to develop your moral character, and he actually put it into practice. And one of the things he wanted to work on was talk less, listen more. You know, you learn you learn with your ears, not with your mouth. Uh, <laughs> you know, and there are people who just we know who rattle on, you know, and 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 shouldn't say, um, you know, should, and should and should stop talking. I just want to say one more thing uh, before we get back to Edison's early childhood and his education uh, about Thomas Sowell, who, who you mentioned, he's a real hero. Um, Thomas Sowell will be 91 in June, and um, you know, Nobel Prizes are generally given to living recipients, and I'm pleading with the Nobel Committee here to award Thomas Sowell you know, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics for Lifetime Achievement, and he abundantly deserves it. So I just wanted to get that on record, John. Absolutely. I, I definitely second that. And it's interesting that quote about uh, Franklin, talk less, listen more. Another interesting fact about Edison and one that he actually credited with some success is that when he was very young, I think 12, he had scarlet fever. And this apparently did a number on his ears and he had bad hearing. He's partially deaf throughout most of his life. And But he credited this with being able to pay attention to his thought processes, right. to be able to do things like read distracted by people's conversations to be able to focus on translating telegraphs which we'll get into uh so yeah he he uh he he uh maybe didn't listen more but he he certainly listened to his own inclinations more um, yeah right he listened but, to his own thoughts when you when you're mostly deaf it's hard to listen to what, what other people have have to say you know it's interesting that he thought it gave him greater powers of concentration that he wasn't distracted as much as he otherwise would be i can understand that but, you know, the trade off of not being able to hear music, you know, or not being able to uh, sit through a good movie and get the dialogue, well, a field that Edison contributed to, you know, the, the film industry, or just not be able to hear uh, in conversation people you really care about, people you're, you're close to, you know, to strain to have to listen. It's not, it, I don't think it's worth it. But anyhow, uh, yeah. it, certainly did it, it's, it's, it certainly didn't harm Edison's productive, his creative career, that's for sure. And, you know, it's been a theme, right? It's a light motif that has been running through the Arrow Show. You you mentioned it, inauspicious beginnings. Uh, I have here, just just by accident, of course, but I happened to find <laughs> this this biography of uh, of Edison. I'm trying to trying to line it up with the camera. Uh, this biography of Edison. This is by of all. This is a really good biography. Uh, Edison, a biography is the title of it. Of all people, Matthew Josephson. Wrote a, wrote a terrific biography of Edison. I say of all people because this is the book Joseph Sins, you know, infamous for mm -hmm. the robber barons, you know, where he, he mm -hmm. just, he, he, uh, he tells endless lies about the great uh, 19th century American entrepreneurs and industrialists. But he wrote a very admiring biography of Edison. And it's, you know, this, uh, it's, it's really good. Anyhow, I don't remember if it's in Josephson's biography or one of the other ones I've read. Oh, because over the years I've, uh, you know, I've been fascinated by Edison and read a lot about him. But one of his biographers said <laughs> Edison, Edison went to some private school for what a few months, I think, uh, and he got he got kicked out of the fourth grade. One of his, his biographers said the headmaster told you know Nancy Edison his mother that the kid's brain was addled. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they call adult, of course, not a word that's commonly used anymore, but I mean, you know, it means confused. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting how many times we've seen, you know, the, the people who, who grow to be heroes, that their early, their early childhood, they either were, they weren't good students or they were, you know, Edison was, didn't Edison burn down, actually burn down his father's barn, you know, in an experiment yeah. gone awry. It was experiments. So had, yeah. 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 Yeah, he had a lot of experiments gone awry, misadventures that burned down his father's bond, cost him a job, got kicked out of school. You, know, you figure this kid's a juvenile delinquent; he's gonna end up, you know, in in the uh, in juvie. But that's not that's not what happened. He was an autodidact. Yeah, wasn't? irony of ironies. Yeah, and and you know, in, when he was around ten years old, in eighteen fifty seven, his family moves to Port Huron to take advantage of the burgeoning economy there, and. Edison takes to the local library, and like you said, autodidact, by the age of 12, within two years, he had read Edward Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. He'd read most of Shakespeare. He'd read all the material on philosophy, chemistry, and electricity that he could get. 
Uh, his mother right. saw that he was, you know, e extremely interested in science and, and bought him a, a dictionary of chemistry and allowed him to set up a lab in their cellar. You know, how many uh, how many mothers nowadays are are allowing their sons to set up labs in their cellar? I guess many of them uh, might be introducing them to coding and things like that. This this day and age. Yeah, Edison. Edison's mother sounded like a, you know an, an exceptional woman and you know a really, really, really good mother. You know, no matter what the headmaster said, said what did or didn't say about her son, whether what he said the kid's brain was addled or not, she knew this kid was special. You know, she knew she she could see the potential. Like you said, she was a school teacher. She taught him herself as much as she could, and then he was beyond her capacities and, and he and he studied on his own like like you said john so you know kudos for mrs edison uh it's hard it's, it's hard to be the parent of a exceptional child in, in some ways and uh you know good 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 for her it's hard to recognize it sometimes uh and then it's hard to you know to realize some people you some people they just have to go their own way they just have to do it themselves and maybe one in a million or one in a hundred million you know uh who just you just have to let them let them go. Let them let them find their own path. And it sounds like uh, Mrs. Edison realized that about her son, and you know, and, and helped him, you know, uh, along the way as much as she could. Yeah. Not only was he incredibly inquisitive, but he was also extremely enterprising, even from a very young age. At the age of fourteen in 1859, he became a newsboy on the rail line that went from Port Huron to Detroit. And not only was he selling the papers, but he started buying groceries, vegetables, fruits, and uh, storing them in the in the mail car, and then selling them at a markup back in Port Huron. And usually the conductors would never allow such such business, but he agreed to sell the, to them at wholesale. So they sort of look the other way. And uh, so he sets up newsstands and, and produce stands in Port Huron and starts hiring some of his young friends. And even sets up a little printing press in one of the baggage cars and starts uh, printing his own newspaper, the Weekly Standard, in which he announced the train schedules, birth announcements, the prices of the goods he was selling. And, you know, he, he he's off to a good start. Here at 14, he's already got a business employing like four of his young friends. It's pretty incredible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and his entrepreneurship over the course of his life, he he helped establish. I think I think it was like fourteen companies. One of them eventually became General Electric. You know the yeah. giant, you know, giant uh, company that 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 it remain remains to this day. So yeah, he was he was extremely entrepreneurial. Like you said before, he was not a ivory tower guy. He was not a pie in the in the in the sky guy but it's interesting that you know he was experimenting and studying he was experimenting when he was working on for the railroad what was it the grand trunk railroad yeah. in michigan didn't, didn't didn't one of his experiments there go awry also i forget the i forget the details a couple it, yeah so I, this first yeah. railroad he was working on uh he had he was conducting chemical experiments in in one of the train cars set fire to the car and was promptly kicked <laughs> off with all his stuff so uh, he didn't find another job. He started doing odd jobs around the train station. And he saw one day a young toddler who had wandered into the path of a runaway freight car. And so he ran, saved the boy. And at this point, telegraphy was all the rage in the U.S. And everyone, this was the, the sexiest technology of the day. He really wanted to learn telegraphy. He already started to teach himself Morse code. And the, the toddler that he had saved was actually James McKenzie, the station agent there at the station. And he taught Edison telegraphy. So Edison gains this incredible skill. He's 14, 15 years old, uh, picks up this incredible skill that he would then use to land a job at the Grand Trunk Railroad in Ontario. Which, as you mentioned, there's another mishap there. Uh, he was experimenting with a, a new form of giving the all clear slash stop signal experimenting all night, working all day, fell asleep when he was supposed to give the signal and the train roars past the station. When it wakes him up, he runs out, tries to flag it down because there's an oncoming train. But he trips, falls in a ditch, knocks himself out. Luckily, the conductors of the two oncoming trains saw each other in a, in a straightaway and avoided a collision and what would have been many deaths. But Edison saw the writing on the wall. He knew his reputation thereafter would be tarnished. And so he came back to the U.S. and Sort of became a, a a tramp telegrapher, 
working for a bunch of different railroads and even working for the Union Army in the Civil War uh, as a telegrapher. Yeah, you, know, you can't make this stuff up. That story about you know, he, he he knocked himself out of the ditch. You know, thank God. You know, the, you, thank God the engineers you got you know could see the each each other coming. They were they were able to stop the trains in time to avoid you know such a such a terrible accident. But what was the job? I remember reading that was he was I think it was a telegraphy job he had. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, he was doing some chemical experiment and and and, and it, <laughs> it, it leaked or or it spilled and 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 the the chemicals leaked down through the floorboards and you know and burned uh, in the floor below his boss's desk. You know he was promptly yeah. fired from the from that job from that job. Was that a telegraphy yeah. job? I, I yeah yeah. I mean you know when, when you yeah, when you're yeah. Thomas he was Edison, working you know, for yeah yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, it was a telegraphy job. I was just answering. I think he was working for Western Union and he took the night shift so he could experiment during the day. And he's working with um, with battery acid and it dripped down through the floorboards onto his boss's desk and fired the next day. So, so yeah, we, had a, we, we need a scorecard to rattle off all the jobs that Edison was fired from, not to mention burning down his <laughs> father's barn. Like, probably got a good yeah. hiding for that, as they used to, as they used to say. But you know, when you're when you're Thomas Edison and you're an inveterate experimenter from a very young age, this is uh, you know it's interesting. This um, sometimes it's just you know people with their own vision, like like Edison, they 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 go their own way, and sometimes before they hit it big, sometimes it's hard to distinguish you know, a, a budding hero from a from an Edwell. You know, from a budding criminal, you know, maybe, and uh, you know, that's 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 uh, you know, that's what you know. Ayn Rand talks about Howard Rock in those early chapters in the Fountainhead when he gets bounces out of this when he you know he gets bounced out of the Stanford Institute of Technology. You know, was it one of one of his professors says to the dean? He shows them the design of Rock. Said, "This is a great man." You know, well, the professor recognized it, but the dean said he didn't, the dean didn't approve of great men. He said great man or a criminal. You know, he thought he didn't approve of either. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you know, sometimes, yes. sometimes, you know, budding genius like Edison causes all kinds of problems. Uh, you know, in in conventional life, and it's it's hard to it gets kicked out of school. I don't know how many jobs? I'm not don't even know how many jobs he got fired from. You know, for, you know, for his misadventures with experimentation, but he keeps going, doesn't he? Because he has his own vision, and he uh, uh, becomes an expert telegrapher, and eventually makes real improvements to the telegraph, doesn't he? Yeah, when he was not t quite twenty-two in eighteen sixty-nine, uh, he decides to form his own um, inventing company. He starts his lab. Yeah. And he gets his first patent shortly thereafter for an automatic vote counter. Um, he also soon invents um, a fire alarm that uses the same uh, relays as the telegraph and a stock ticker, which ended up being a pretty big success. The, the vote counter, not so much, um, but uh, the, the invented a, a telegraphic stock ticker. And it was really the first substantial income that he, he got from his companies. So. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, it's interesting start to his his family life here as well. Uh, just a couple of years later, when he was 24 years old, uh, he spotted a a a fine young lady working for him in a, in his labs, uh, working class uh, young teenager, 16 years old, Mary Stillwell, and gives one of the most awkward proposals in history. Uh, he, he he walks up and asks her, "What do you think of me?" No need to tell me quickly, uh, you know, just uh, if you're interested in marrying me, just let me know. And you don't, you know, you don't have to tell me now. Maybe talk to your mom and maybe tell me like next Tuesday. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> this, this poor 16 year old girl, you know, getting hearing this from her boss must have just been a, must have just been aghast, you know, at, at this. Yeah, but uh, you know he's a pretty handsome fellow, and at this point already pretty successful. And she doesn't even wait to the next Tuesday; she comes back and, and accepts his proposal, and they're married shortly thereafter on Christmas Day.
Well, if Mary Stillwell had a crush on her boss, this was uh, this must have been very welcome, uh, very, no matter how awkward, how awkwardly done. Um, but the uh, the quadruplex telegraph is a was a, a mm -hmm. substantial improvement to the telegraph because it it, it enabled quad of course, referring to four, right? What it, it enabled two messages to travel back and forth across the same wire at the same time. Was that the, was that what the innovation was, as I recall? Yeah, I thought, you know, I read uh, four messages at a time, but it could be the back and forth that you're talking about. And, and this was a huge boon, boon to the, All right. the Western Union and other telegraphy right. companies because they didn't have to build as many lines and, and invest all that money right. in the creation of new lines. They could just use the same ones. Right. Well, four messages, anyway, with regardless of which direction they were moving in, four messages on the same line at the same time. And like we said at the top of the show, Edison made a nice chunk of change when he sold that to Western yeah. Union, you know, worth over $200,000 in today's, in today's money. And uh, that's the, that was the money that he used to, to, to uh, build the laboratory at Menlo Park, right? That was the money that he used to, to bankroll his uh you know his and that's and that's significant because uh this is one of edison's major innovations that he he was he established um the one of the first maybe the first industrial research lab at menlo park in 1876 using the money from the sale of the telegraph to western union yeah the lab itself was an innovation uh this really right. didn't exist before right. so one of the first research parks in history, you know, he, com he complained about the noisy city. He was sick, he said, of the gassy hospitality and the idiotic journalists and the female men. <laughs> so he plows he his own. Oh, 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 female <laughs> men. Yeah. Oh, oh he'd have a yeah. fit today <laughs> with his snowflakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was. And, and so, you know, one of the things we should bring up is this just incredible team of mathematicians and engineers and mechanics that uh, he assembles here at Menlo Park. And this just group of devoted, doggedly determined inventors that uh, are, are absolutely uh, uh, devoted to Edison's um, ideal of inventing something useful every 10 days and something great and probably marketable every month. These guys would work <laughs> all day, six days a week, take one day off. and. They're just a, a bunch of, uh, you know, like I said, doggedly determined uh, mechanics, yeah, at, inventors, at, mathematicians. Look at that picture, John. Look more like a bunch of pirates. I mean, what? Yeah. What a bunch of rough dudes. Uh, mechanics, maybe. I don't. I don't see mathematicians in this crowd. But you know, what do I know? <laughs> but yeah, you're you're right. They uh, uh, they. Uh, was a somebody I don't know. Yeah, he was annoyed. Edison was annoyed by journalists. I I, I know that he told one. I think, um, you know, when when they asked him about you know the work conditions at his lab, he said you know and and the, and the pay to his work is he, he he said we pay nothing at all. We work all the time. Or maybe he referred, we work all the time. We pay <laughs> nothing at all. He said you know and he uh, well the work the work all the time was accurate. I don't know how much he paid his his staff, but. But the work, the work all the time, like you said, yeah, and, yeah, and the, yeah, abs absolutely right, and it paid off, right? I, I mean, Edison astonished the world from from, from what I've read with the invention of the phonograph. What what, what year was that? It was eighteen seventy seven? I think. Yeah, um, you're right. He drove his staff hard to produce results, and they did. The phonograph in eighteen seventy seven. We'll get to the to electric light, of course, a couple of years later, but. The phonograph was like unexpected. Nobody, you know, nobody, nobody saw it coming. It was, it was considered. A, it was it, people thought it was like magic, you know. And they, and he, he, and he was dubbed at that point the Wizard of Menlo Park, because because the phonograph was was so new, so original, so unexpected, and of course, uh, you know, it went on to went on to great things. You know, it's interesting, John, the way. Uh, in a free society, in a free market, the way innovations build upon innovations, uh, the development of the photograph made it, you know, it was a first step towards making it uh, possible for musicians to, to start to make money. You know, to, you, later on, you could create albums and you could sell albums and eventually, of course, CDs, phonograph, you know, 
I don't know how many people are using a turntable these days, although I, I hear it's making a comeback. Your know, turntables and vinyl yeah. make a comeback. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but anyway, it, 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 late 19th, turn of the 20th century, this was this was a revolution. It certainly, certainly made possible, you know, the, uh, and, and it made it, it made it not possible for musicians to make money, well deserved in many cases, but for people to enjoy music at home. You know, put you know, put the, put yeah. you know, put this you know Beethoven's ninth on the on the phonograph and listen to the Ode to Joy, you know, whatever whatever you know, whatever music that that the person loves. Uh, it, it, it's this you it's a kind of, this is the kind of thing that's incalculable. You know how much meaning and how much passion and how much joy this brought into human life. How do you measure how much pleasure people have gotten from listening to music over the last hundred and you know and you know and, and some odd years on the you know on the on their phonograph? You know? Yeah, you can't. It's just it's it's just this incredible value, and and like you said, it was pretty unplanned for. Even Edison wasn't looking to develop this like he was many of his other inventions. Actually, what happened was he attended the 1876 Centennial uh, Exhibition in Philadelphia. And this was to look at the first hundred years of America and just the incredible commercial and industrial success that the country had had in its first hundred years. And, you know, Edison was there. He had uh, he'd come up with an electric pen that was actually the first copying machine. It was pretty cool. It could poke holes as you wrote, and then you could use that as a stencil and another mechanism, put ink through it, and you had a copy. But the star of the show was Alexander Graham Bell with his telephone. And Western Union, when they got wind of this whole telephone business, they thought, wow, this is a huge threat to our telegraphy business. What are we going to do? And so they put, they, they tasked Edison with coming up with a speaking telegraph. And so Edison starts experimenting with uh, communication uh, mechanisms. And you know, one of the things about Bell's telephone was that the, the sound was pretty muddy. And so Edison actually comes up with a much better microphone transmitter. And it was the transmitter that was actually used until the 1990s for most designs. But right. that patent actually got contested. And, and anyway, Western Union had to sell the patent to Bell. But when he was developing this, he thought, hmm, this is we're converting this into electrical energy. What would happen if we put a point on the end of that and then transmit that energy into a soft rotating surface? We could record that and then we could play it back. They tried it. It worked. It was a, it was a huge success. Uh, Edison uh, went to show this off at Scientific American a few months later when they sort of had perfected their design. And uh, the people at Scientific American, and there's a great quote that I've got to read. He said, they said, uh, Mr. Thomas A. Edison recently came into this office, placed a little machine on our desk, turned a crank, and the machine inquired as to our health, asked how we liked the phonograph, informed us that it was very well, <laughs> And bid us a cordial good night. <laughs> and this is an instant success. Um, he's invited to demonstrate the phonograph before Congress and before President Rutherford B. Hayes. And uh, orders just start piling up for this phonograph. And Edison goes from, you know, this little known inventor to sort of a household name because of the competition yeah. and building on previous uh, innovations, just like you said. Yeah, it, 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 it was a sensation. And uh, there's a couple of things uh, came to my mind when when you were talking, John. Didn't they call what well, Ed, Edison? You know, had the new spe the improved speaker for for Bell's telephone. Didn't they start to call it the shouting telephone because the sound the sound came through? I think they called it the shouting telephone because the sound came through so much more <laughs> aud audibly than in, than in, in in Bell's original. But speaking of Bell, we have to do a hero show, you know, on Bell. Mm, you know, absolutely the. the yeah, I mean the the invention of the telephone, all that made possible. I got my I got my i I got my i twelve here, you know, you know, somewhere, you know, innovations upon innovations, right? But um, when I was writing the Capitalist Manifesto, I, I was doing this research, John. I think everybody out in Hero Land is going to appreciate this story. I was never able to track it down. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I got it from a couple of sources. I think this story is accurate. I don't think it's apocryphal. I think it's true. You know, Bell's telephone, 1876, 1877. No, nobody at first saw any real commercial, you know, viability for it. He so he was he he took the he took the patent rights to telephone to Western Union, like like you, you were just talking about, and he offered to sell them full patent rights to telephone for hundred thousand dollars. Now, hundred thousand dollars in the late eighteen seventies was a lot of money. 
you know, but for full patent rights to the telephone. And the wonks, uh, yeah, they, and these guys at Western Union, they're, they're not dopes. I mean, it's, that's the high tech company of the day, like like you said before. But they didn't see the potential. They they said it's a toy. What are you know? What are we gonna? What are we gonna do with this? You know. So so Bell couldn't sell the patent rights to Western Union for hundred thousand dollars. Unfortunately for 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 everybody, including us, his father in law. Uh, was Gardner, Gardner Green Hubbard? I think his name was. Was an entrepreneur. He saw, he saw the you know the commercial viability for it, set up the Bell Telephone Company, which eventually morphed into you know AT and T, the communications giant. A few years later, Western Union offered Bell something like twenty five million for the full patent rights to the telephone. At which point, Bell demurred. And interesting, Bell, not Edison, Bell became the wealthiest inventor of the late 19th turn of the 20th century. Edison made a lot of money, but Bell made even more. And that's, you know, because of, in part because of the entrepreneurial spirit of his father-in-law, Hubbard, in, in setting up the Bell Telephone Company. But you know what the point is here, your point of the takeaway is here? Even with something as magnificent as the telephone, it's hard to see potential. It, it's even, even for experts of Western Union who are, you know, the electrical, you know, they're a high tech company. It's hard to see the potential of something that hasn't been done yet. It's hard to see that the telephone will be, you know, uh, cross, cross, you know, content, transcontinental, and then all around the world, uh, uh, enabling people to communicate when it's never been done, and all you have is a little prototype toy. It's hard to see. It's hard to. It's hard to see the future. But Edison did. Yeah. Uh, Bell's Bell and his father-in-law did. Uh, Henry Ford did another guy we do hear a show on, but Edison does certainly with the electric with the electric light, doesn't he? Because other guys had experimented Absolutely. with electric lights before him. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Uh, well, like you said, uh, it takes vision, and I think Edison. I, I don't want to be comparative here, but this this man had an incredible vision, and mm -hmm. on the on the basis of his newfound fame for the the phonograph. And he immediately announces this plan to make electricity. He says, we're going to make el electricity so cheap that only the rich will burn candles. And he announces <laughs> this plan to tackle the electric light because people had come up, like you said, they'd come up with electric light bulbs, but they only burn for a few minutes. And so there was no right. commercial viability with that. So he, he mm -hmm. announces this plan to illuminate lower Manhattan. And uh, immediately money pours in. People are interested in funding this project. You know, the gas lamps at the time, they require an open flame. They smell terribly uh, dangerous. If you, if you mm -hmm. have one on in a closed space, you could suffocate from the fumes. And so he, you know, he and his team begin the arduous process of coming up with a filament that will burn for hours and hours on end. And his, uh, you know, his second in command, I would say, Charles Batchelor, is the one who hits upon the special formula of the cotton thread dusted with carbon that will burn this one for 13 hours. And they use it. They illuminate their lab. And they illuminate the, the path or the road from the lab to the train station. And they make this announcement in 1879. Visitors car start coming to see for the, the first time in history, walking down an electrically lit street into a fully lit building. And it's just this incredible sight to see. And, and so Edison is, is making a name for himself here. And, you know, this is, this is the, the vision, I think, of a CEO. He's not just thinking in terms of, okay, what's the technology? How do we, how do we make it successful? But he's also thinking in terms of how do, we, uh, how do we inspire people with this incredible vision such that they'll, they'll just come together to sort of pull this out of us. They won't let us fail because they want it so badly. And he was so good at that, of, of just putting out this inspiring, incredible vision for people to, to, uh, to, to long for, almost like you know, this glamorous object. They really wanted it. Right. And you can see why. A uh, couple of things. Um, you were talking about gas lamps. Well, you know, we honored a, a, a previous giant, John D. Rockefeller at Standard Oil, you know, who, 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 who uh, created or produced a great deal of petroleum products at inexpensive prices, making it possible for people to have, you know, it was a kerosene, right? The lamps were, were illuminated by, by, by burning kerosene. It's dangerous, uh, so are candles, you know, but, uh, but it gave so much more light than candles. It was such an advance at the time. 
that you know it made as we as we acknowledged when we were honoring Rockefeller, it made studying at night, reading, you know, and, and you know, nighttime activities, not just with the, with the day. Well, you know, the, the the gas lamp industry was 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 established, or certainly becoming established by the time Edison invents the electric light bulb. He's going into competition with uh, with 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 gas lighting, uh, knowing that electricity could be could be uh, produced. Uh, uh, it's more expensively or you know, more cheaply and less dangerously. So, uh, you know, and, and didn't, it didn't, it didn't hurt Rockefeller that much at Standard Oil, did he? He went on into other, he went on into other fields, including the, the production of gasoline, you know, years later where to, to power Henry Ford's automobile. Again, the, the great thing of free society and a free market, how innovations just build upon innovations that we'll, you know, we'll discuss when we, we get to Henry Ford. But another thing here, uh, if 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 any if any of you guys out there have seen the the recent film, the current war, I don't know I don't know if you've seen mm. if you've seen that, John. Mm -hmm. But the current that's a great movie. The, yeah, yeah, the current war. You know, I, I strongly recommend it. And we're we're going to get to this, this to this point in a few minutes, right? The the war of the currents or the battle of the currents, with, with Edison favoring direct current or DC and George Westinghouse and his engineer, Nikola Tesla, was inventor Tesla, uh, favoring alternating current or, or AC. But th that shows that scene, you know, early in the movie with, when, when Ed Edison's a showman, he's a, he's a PR guy. You know, he's, he's, got, mm. he's a man of different talents. He's showing off, he's showing this off, how great it is. And you know, people are just, he's got people like, you know, they're panting to get, to get his, uh, you know, his, his, his electric light. Uh, but, but, you know, it, and, 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 and understandably so. And we should point out, uh, like with Ford, you know, other people prior to Ford had invented automobiles, but they didn't see the commercial viability of it. Ford did, right? Ford had the vision. Ford saw the future that, you know, automobile was going to replace the horse and buggy as the primary means of, of personal transportation. Well, other guys, like you said, they invented, had light bulbs, but they just didn't last long enough. You're right. Edison set out, we're going to have one, in, you know, uh, that, that's long lasting. And, and what was it? I forget the, the exact numbers, but um, it was, it was, it was several months after I think his patent was granted in 1880 that Edison and his team discovered that carbonized bamboo filament could last 1200 hours, 1200 hours. Now that, is commercially, you know, that you could sell, you know, and make money. You know, Twelve hundred hours is nothing. Is nothing to sneeze at. That's eighteen eighty, so it's very early. Uh, Edison had the vision, like Ford, could see the future. You know, electric light would replace gas lamp. Uh, automobiles replaced the horse and buggy. The Wright brothers, you know, had had that vision that this this, this you know this could take transportation to new heights, literally. Uh, you know, and these are people who who uh, who reshaped the world, and that you know, and that we honor on the Hero Show because they've done so much to improve our lives and, and human life, generally. So Edison, like you said, entrepreneur, he's going to electrify New York City, right? He sets up the power stage. What was it, Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan, early eighteen eighties? Yeah, Pearl Street. Yeah, right. Eighteen eighties. Uh, in 82 uh they so they've got to go through the process though because they've at this point they've electrified a, a few different places a few different being uh a, a steamship is the first project the owner of a steamship i think his last name was villard uh wanted yeah. he, you know he saw the demonstration he wanted electric light on his steamship so they uh, installed a, a steam power generator there and we're able to do it. And then a print company in Manhattan, they wanted the uh, ability to see their swatches and continue printing late at night. So that was the second test. And number three, it's a big one. Uh, uh, you know, a square mile of lower Manhattan. And this requires something like six, they were called dynamos, but these electric generators, uh, gigantic electric generators that uh, produce an enormous amount of power. Uh, they can they can power up to twelve thousand bulbs each. Of course, this is nothing by by today's standards, but this is incredible for the time. And um, and so in December eighteen eighty two, the the big day comes, the big test. Is this thing going to work? We put something like six and a half million dollars into developing this. Edison's been working with the the local authorities to lay all these copper wires under the streets and and get uh, power set up. 
flip the there you have it the gas lamps the, the smelly gas lamps they're dangerous they're supplanted by this much cheaper safer uh, efficient electric light it's just this turning point in history like you said no innovation is safe there's this just infinite uh series of advancements and of course as we're going to talk about even this new dc generator is is amazing yeah. uh, as of an innovation as it was wasn't safe from further innovation that's right that's right less expensive safer and a brighter illuminant it was just better than gas gas lamp in every way you know it's a cloudy day in the new york suburbs John, I have my three-way, I have my three-way bulb on here in, you know, in in, in my office. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a nice illuminant, and you know, and I'm a, I, I really, I, I mean, I have tremendous admiration for Thomas Edison, whatever his flaws were, uh, and we'll discuss a couple, but uh, tremendous admiration because I'm a bookworm, and so like every night before I go to sleep, it's dark. You know, it's, uh, maybe, maybe uh, you, you and I are on different schedules. You know, you're a morning person, John. I'm a night person. So I get to bed. It's 11 at night or it's midnight. And I have, you know, my Sherlock Holmes with me. Or, you know, I have, you know, I have Nero Wolf or whatever it is I'm reading for pleasure, you know, before bed, some, you know, some great detective story. And I'm reading, but the electric light is on. It's perfectly, you know, bright in the in in the bedroom and you know and, and i think a lot of, you know not every night but a lot, a lot of nights i i think thank you you know thomas edison for you know for for making this possible um but there's one other thing i want to say about your know, pearl street actually a couple of things um jp morgan was one of the guys who funded uh edison right again another hero that we need we'll, we'll need to discuss on on the hero show and i think there were members of the vanderbilt family also and you know the patriarch there, Cornelius Vanderbilt. We certainly need to honor him. There's a lot of heroes. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, we'll never run out of material and, and inspiration. It's great. But I want to say this: a little bit of an aside, but not that much. It's relevant. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, Americans around the country, who hate New York City. And in, in some ways, I, c I can understand it. You know, I, I, you know, if you grow up in the, you know, in the farms in in Kansas, or New York is dirty and smelly and it's everything moves at this fast place and everything you know plus plus new york's got a bunch of leftist intellectuals who you know who who hate america so so there's a there's a lot of americans around the country you know i went to college in south dakota and i'm you know i've hitchhiked all over the country traveled around the country so i know this firsthand but there's also a lot of provincial new yorkers who look down their nose and and um, if fly people in fly over country you know as their rubes you know they're, they're ignorant rednecks and the both mistaken, you know, at the fundamental level, New York City is the quintessential American city. Only the Americans could have built this city because uh, it's the commercial center, not only of the country, it's the business capital of the world. Uh, uh, you know, and, and you look at, at some of the history, you know, Washington, you know, Washington is the first president, you know, was his farewell address, right, was in New York, was in New York City. Uh, where did Rockefeller and Carnegie, whose plants were further west, western Pennsylvania and Ohio, where did they come to build their corporate headquarters, New York City? Where does Edison come, you know, to, to you know, as a, as a young inventor to make his name and settles in the New Jersey and the New York suburbs and immortalizes, you know, uh, his, his, his record by, you know, the Pearl Street generators lighting lower Manhattan, even though it was what, something like 59 customers. You know, I think the first, you know, the, the first lighting JP Morgan on Wall Street is a brilliant venture capitalist. And I'm thinking of all of this, you know, when I'm you know, reading about Ayn Rand's life, young Alyssa Rosenbaum, age 21, you know, she enters, it comes into New York Harbor and there's the Statue of Liberty and she, you know, she enters the country through Ellis Island. This is the quintessential American city. And it's, um, it's ridiculous. It's just absolutely absurd that there should be this opposition between many New Yorkers and many uh, uh, Americans outside of New York. But it's, it's very fitting. Edison develops the first power station at Pearl Street to electrify Lower Manhattan. Uh, a very small number of customers by our standard, I think it was 59, but uh, baby steps, right? Mankind advances yeah. in baby yeah, steps. Yeah, within a couple of years, there were, yeah, yeah. A couple of years later in 1884, he was serving 500 buildings. And, um, you know, this made him a millionaire. 
he's he's now world famous. He's now a millionaire, and he decides he needs a much bigger lab. And um, you know, unfortunately, in 1884, uh, Mary's wife also dies. And you know, one of the things right. I know we'll talk about is just Edison was not a great family man. I mean, he's this very he was this sort of Victorian gentleman era kind of guy that uh, you just expected that. All of the, the the family stuff, the raising of the kids, it's all the wife's job and I'm taking off. And and so Mary, very young age, 29 years old, she's been through a pretty stressful life and, uh, you know, probably saw this coming to some extent when, when she married a young inventor who was married to his work. But um, but yeah, it's just it's, it's, it's terribly sad. But um, yeah, you know, the, the next yeah, chapter and, and is- of his story. Mm-hmm. Edison Go ahead. evidently yeah. really, really ev- Edison evidently really loved her. Uh, Mary yeah. still when she died. What they don't know was it a brain tumor? Was it an overdose of, of morphine? Because they, you know you know doctors used to prescribe that for you know for the pain back then. But yeah, it was it, it was very sad. Um, and I forget did they have three children? He had three children with Mary. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then three and then three with Mina, right? Uh, Mm-hmm. Several, several, several years later. Yeah, and here's one of the, so that's that's you know tragic that that Mary, you know, probably the love of Edison's life. Certainly, he loved her very much. Died so young; she was 29. Um, but um, yeah, here's here's a negative uh, on Edison. He 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 fathered six children, and then, like you said, John, he was married to his work. So it's a mixed case here. He was it's enormously productive. I mean, he worked like 16 hours a day. You you. you for years so he's enormously inductive which we applaud the two thumbs up is he's a productive like Hank Reardon you know you in Atlas Shrugged he's enormously you know hard working and everything but at the same time morally if you bring children in, into the world you father one child of any number x x that child has every right to expect you to be a dad you know or you know or, or if you're the mother uh to expect you the parent. The a child needs parenting. The child needs. Uh, this is not. This is not altruism or self sacrifice. This the 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 operative principle here is that we're responsible for our actions. Every one of us. And if we, in Edison's case, if we father children, we need to be a father to the child. The child has every right to expect uh, his biological, his or her biological father to parent. And and Edison evidently did. I mean, evidently, Edison loved the the kids from what I, from what I've read, but he spent did not spend the quality time with them that a, that a child deserves. So we could properly properly criticize him. This is a moral flaw. This is a this is not just a you know a a, a problem with with etiquette or this is a moral failing. He's not, this is not t- taking full responsibility for his actions. So we criticize uh, Ed, Edison for this, um, and and his children. Some of his children grew up to have real problems, as I as I remember. You know, yeah, they did, and and you're right, though he absolutely did love her and 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 mourned her terribly. Uh, his his kids found him just inconsolable, just just sobbing, and and uh, but he he recovered, and uh, three years after this, he decides to con- continue to expand. I mean, this is not a guy that rests on his laurels. Even from very young age, he's making money, but he's always putting his money back into his businesses. And so in 87, he's a millionaire. He plows $180,000 of the day's money into a West Orange laboratory closer to his home, 30 times larger than Menlo Park. Uh, one of the, the news articles at the time it describes it. This is just an incredible quote that I have to read here. 8,000 kinds of chemicals. He's describing the, the contents of the lab. Uh, every kind of screw made, every size of needle, every kind of cord or wire, hair of humans, Horses, hogs, cows, rabbits, goats, minks, camels, silk in every texture, cocoons, various kinds of hoofs, shark's teeth, deer horns, tortoise shell, cork resin. This this list just keeps going and going and going. And, uh, you know, this again is, this is an industrial research laboratory and the first of its kind, the best stocked laboratory in the world. So uh, Edison is not only innovating in terms of his is uh, the fruits of, of his labor, the things that he's putting out, his new inventions, his new innovations, but he's innovating in the uh, methods of of doing science and doing research and and creating new technologies. He's he's creating the technology of technology, which is just this incredible achievement that, of course, lives with us today. 
research parks all over the country and all over the world. Right, right. The, I mean, Menlo Park, and then and then later on, the uh, you know the, the the much larger West Or much larger lab in West Orange. These were the first. The, the one in Menlo Park was the first research lab, in, in industrial research lab in history. Uh, so, certainly one of the first. The first one, first one in America, but um, what I, I want to say here, you know, a, a couple of things. Uh, we, you know, we I criticize Edison for you know failing to take responsibility, you know, with with his children as a moral flaw. Nobody could possibly criticize Thomas Edison's work ethic. <laughs> That's just not possible, <laughs> you know. And uh, and his immortal line that genius is one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent perspiration, you know, is uh, is so true. It's so valuable. It's so inspiring. And he put it into practice. And I want to say, you know, the reason we honor Thomas Edison on the Hero Show, despite you know moral failings, is similar to with with Thomas Jefferson, although the moral failings were different. And that is. Um, there's a lot of people who aren't good dads, but but this one guy, you know, who invented the phonograph and the electric light light bulb or the commercially viable electric light bulb and contributed so much to the motion picture industry and so on and so forth. And that guy is Thomas Edison. And you know, as Ayn Rand taught us, you know, brilliantly, uh, the good is more important than the, than than the bad. That which promotes human life is the most Im important thing. And Edison's work promoted human life monumentally. And so we acknowledge the moral flaws for what they are. As honest men, we must. But we focus on the achieve the life giving achievements as we should. And um, yeah, we, we 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 we'd be remiss if we didn't dis uh, discuss at least uh, briefly the the war of the currents. Uh, and because yeah, you know, so Western here's another moral people. flaw that go we ahead. yeah go on go ahead. yeah you know we, we've talked about one moral flaw and, there, and there's another one here uh, you know in by '88 the the year after he established his new laboratory uh, he had established dynamos in 121 municipalities throughout the country but by that year uh, Westinghouse who had purchased a patent uh, for an uh, alternating current dynamo from from Nikola Tesla had already secured 68 municipalities. And so Edison goes on the attack and talk about dirty deeds done dirt cheap. I mean, th this just gets really uh, uh, just mind bogglingly uh, disgusting in, in character. And, um, you know, it just shows right. his, 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 you know, his, his worst side. Edison, yeah. you know, he wasn't perfect, but like you said, his, Virtues far outweighed his flaws, but we definitely have to unpack some of these flaws here. The, the Westinghouse yeah. and the yeah. War of the Currents. Yeah. And, the, and that, again, the film, The Current War, is very good on that because it shows how ugly this 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 dirty side of Edison was while, while never losing sight of his genius. Uh, in fact, there's one scene, in, and I strongly recommend it, the, uh, the Current War. Benedict Cumberbatch is Edison. Uh, Michael Shannon as George Westinghouse was Nicholas Holt as uh, as Nikola Tesla. It's very good. Uh, there's a one scene I don't remember the details because it's a few years ago. But you know, Westinghouse is talking to his his head engineer. But we 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 need to we we need to you know make this innovation. And the engineer says it can't be done. And you know, and and Westinghouse says, well, wh wh why do you say that? And and the engineer says, of course, if it could be done, Edison would have done it already. <laughs> you know, it always <laughs> it always has this veneration. The film always has this veneration for Edison's genius. But yeah, Edison electrocuted. You know, he, he alternating current deals with evidently with a lot of power. You know. But the, the invention of the transformer, where you you know you could you could power up and power down as the you know as you bring the current into somebody's house to light their you know their their living room lights, the transformer had had remediated a great deal of the danger. But uh, but Edison, you know, uh, with an eye on you know win, the, winning the commercial struggle here, you know, claimed that AC was really dangerous. That people were going to Westinghouse was going to kill, you know, Westinghouse's company was going to kill people. He fried a bunch of dogs and cats, you know, from the neighbor in the neighborhood. Uh, he, he, he 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 yeah, uh, all kinds of animals. He uh, it's horrible. He um, 
if any animal lover, you know, it's really horrible. He he also, you know, contributed to the electric chair being, uh, you know, be, being powered by by a by a alternating current, even though he didn't want his invention to be used to kill people. You know, he still supported the, an AC driven electric chair. And it's funny, the first guy that was fried in the electric chair, I think it was a wife murder. I think he, it was an ax murder, wasn't he? It was horrible crime. But, you know, it was supposed to be, you know, humane. It was supposed to be quick. Because when you hang people, hanging is supposed to break their neck. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the guy is just hanging there choking to death you know so it's you know it's horrible electric chair was supposed to be bam you're done well when they when they fried this guy i think it was in was it in buffalo new york was it uh they had to do it like That's three right. times yeah it, it was horrible it's just like, like uh, it was just it was it was it was grisly and ghastly and edison you know couldn't have foreseen that but he uh he, he threw his he threw his reputation behind you know the uh the development of an ac uh, driven uh, electric chair. So yeah, it was a lot of dirty tricks, as, you know, to try and 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 win this the war of the currents, rather than acknowledging what he must have known, given the the, the genius that he was, that alternating current was much more viable for generating electricity across vast distances. That direct current was good if, for sm for small distances. It was good in the city. We had you know was, you know had a bunch of buildings altogether, but across the vastness of the North American continent, uh, alternating current was uh, was a great advantage. And I, if I remember correctly, Tesla, you know, who was working for, had worked for Edison originally before he left, working for Westinghouse, mm -hmm. developed the idea that we're going to use Niagara Falls, you know, to, to be able to power, you know, the, the, the you know, to, we're going to use that for power and be able to electrify, you know, uh, across the vast distances of the North American continent. Yeah, and and you know uh, even the board at, at so at this point, Edison's companies had combined under the Edison General Electric Company, which you mentioned earlier, and even the the board saw that AC was the future, and that Edison, despite his genius, was losing the current war, and so they they voted to pursue AC. Edison takes this as a huge slight and resigns as chairman of the board. He he stays on. Uh, on the board itself, and so retains a vote and, and a lot of uh, capital in the company. But um, he's, you know, he's pretty, he's a sore loser. And a few years later in 1892, the company takes Edison out of the name and we get General Electric, one of the largest, still one of the largest publicly traded companies in the world. I actually worked there for a while. Both my parents worked there. I worked in uh, Hooks at New Hampshire on airplane engine parts for a couple summers. Uh, but, nice. you know, incredible company that that's still with us today uh, that that Edison founded among the 14 or so companies that he founded in his lifetime. Right. Just incredibly. Right. Yeah. JP, right. J.P. Morgan, the great, you know, financier uh, merged the Edison company with with another uh, electrical company, as I remember, and, and, and founded General Electric or, or, you know, established General Electric. And uh, yeah, you're right. So, you know, it's still. Where do I get my light bulbs to this day? I get GE. You know, I get GE light GE light bulbs. But um, you know, and and Westinghouse and Tesla also have to get a hero show. Uh, those guys, mm -hmm. those guys were also absolutely brilliant, brilliant inventors and and visionaries. And Tesla was a character. You know, <laughs> he was. But uh, <laughs> yeah, in the in the current war. Uh, you know they they have Edison, you know, moving into the motion picture industry and say saying that well, I'm working on something that's going to make people forget I was ever associated with you know with with the electric light. Well, <laughs> nothing's ever nothing's ever going to make people forget that Edison was associated with the electric light for the reasons we gave. But uh, his his contributions to the motion picture industry cannot be you know cannot be denied and cannot be minimized, can they? Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, uh, come up with the kinetograph, the first moving picture camera. And one of his, uh, one of his employees, KL Dixon came up with a celluloid strip that we still associate with movies, although we don't really use celluloid strips anymore. Uh, but they release Edison films releases the first narrative films in history, and they're just releasing film after film. They released the, the great train robbery, which if you go to school and do anything with, uh, with film, you're going to learn the history of film. You're going to see this. Uh, also Frankenstein. And so 
the Edison Film Company begins to dominate in in the film industry. And it's just incredible that, you know, industry after industry, when do you see entrepreneurs like this? I mean, the only modern day equivalent would be somebody like an Elon Musk. But of course, Musk has got his hand in all sorts of government support and basically welfare programs. So this is nothing on the scale of what Edison is doing. It's just, and this isn't the end either. He goes on to, um, to do some pioneering research on rubber at the bequest of Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone and, you know, helps mm -hmm. them, you know, Ford is like, well, we don't, we don't have the rubber trees. They don't grow natively here in the U S we need it, some sort of substitute. And, uh, and so Edison works on the problem and uh, does, does rubber research. I forget what he, uh, it was sort of like a golden wheat that he figured out you could, you could create rubber from, but uh, you know, this is in the, in the 1920s when he's, in his in his late seventies, early eighties, this this is just incredible. Yeah, yeah, his work ethic, his genius, his productivity, just off the charts. We also should mention a bittersweet moment. You know, Edison invents the fluoroscope, which you know is a machine that uses X rays to take radio uh, radio uh, graphs. <laughs> I gotta get the word right. But uh, his assistant, what's his name, Clarence uh, Daly. Who, who volunteered, you know, to be experimented on, evidently very eagerly. They didn't know the dangers of radiation back then. Uh, his assistant died from, uh, you know, from exposure to the radiation. Uh, Daly died at a very young age. And Edison said after, you know, a tragic death of his assistant, you know, that he, he said, don't talk to me about x-rays. He said, I'm terrified. He said, I'm terrified of them. They're, they're starting to realize how dangerous exposure to, to the, you know, that, that large amount of radiation was. But the fluoroscope, nevertheless, was an advance in young, uh, in, in medical, you know, in, in medical diag diagnostics. And young Clarence Daly, death was tragic, but, but not in vain. Yeah, some people give their lives to the advance of science. Of course, we talked about Amelia Earhart on this show, and and there are many, many others that we will talk about. But yeah, he uh, they didn't they didn't know the risks, but they they likely knew there were risks, and he he volunteered, and and it's very sad, very very sad. But this, none, like you said, nonetheless, was a step toward the medical advancements that we now take for granted largely today. Just right. How, right. how could one brain do all of this? You know, one of my favorite quotes from him, he said, many of life's failures are, are uh, people who do not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And, you know, yeah. that's just something to keep in mind when you're, you know, oh, you know, I've, I've tried 999 times. Well, try 10,000. <laughs> keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. Edison working on the, on the electric light. How many, how many substances did he test, for, you know, for the filament? And um, he, he said, you know, that all of these failures were valuable because we learned, you know, we learned what direction to, to, keep, to keep going in. They're, they're, a, they're a lesson in, in those failures. And uh, yeah, he had a very optimistic, you know, and, 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 and sanguine personality. And one of his, um, his peers, another hero for, for our show, Andrew Carnegie, who we, we haven't uh, done yet, but will also said uh, Carnegie said something like, um, "What was what was the line that having having a sunny disposition?" He said, which he Carnegie certainly did. Having a sunny disposition was the most valuable thing, you know, you 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 could have because we see it in Edison, you know, you know so th you know, ten thousand failures. Some of his assistants might say, "You know, Mr. Edison, you know, we you know, we, it's it, it can't be done like." Hank Reardon's assistant say to him in Atlas Shrugged, and, and, and Edison says, no, he said, we, Edison would, would be like, no, we found all the things that don't work. That narrows down the field, you know, for that which will. You know, he had, he had that sunny yeah. disposition that, that Carnegie extolled. And it's, it, is, it is enormously valuable because you keep going. And that's, you, you, that, you're right. That's a great quote from Edison. You don't know how many people gave up after a real effort not realizing how close they were. That's really, that's very sad. But Edison, that, that's not Edison's problem. He just kept going. Yeah. He, yeah. One more gem. He said, when you have exhausted all possibilities, remember this, you haven't. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Yeah, right. 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 Well, you know, um, a few days after Edison died in uh, 1931, 
the Americans, you know, across the country dimmed, dimmed their light bulbs for, for one minute, you know, in his honor. And that kind of, that, you know, that, that's very touching. Honoring the man who Absolutely. Made, it, made, it, made it possible. For all of his errors, you know, battling against Westinghouse and Tesla and alternating current, nevertheless, he's one of the giants, maybe the giant, fundamental giant who made it possible. And honor him we, we have today. Um, I, I'm so excited that we got to talk about Edison. He, he's just, you know, despite his flaws, he, he lit the world. You know, this is another of his obituaries is uh, Edison lit the dark places of the world. He really did. And we continue to derive tremendous benefits from the life he lived and the fruits of that life today. Absolutely. And so I'm going to, you know, going to honor Thomas Edison with a well-deserved salute and John and everybody out there in hero land. I'm going to wish you have a heroic Thursday, have a heroic weekend, and we will be back next week on the hero show. Have a great day, John. You too, Andy.